Welcome to the Coke and Grass educational session being broadcast here from Clemson University. I'm George Kessler, an Emeritus Professor of Forest Resources, and I'm happy to be here with you and to be talking with you today. We've got a lot of topics that we're going to cover, so I'm going to get... Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about Kogan grass. You know, this year we know a lot more about Kogan grass than we did last year, and one of the reasons for that is that last November we had an educational session down in uh, Alabama where the people from all across the southeast got together and came in to look and to see uh, what we knew about Kogan grass. And fortunately, uh, as we pool our efforts and put ourselves together with these different programs, we begin to learn a lot more and to also be able to find ways that we can work on this problem. So if we look at Kogan grass, we find, first of all, that it's not a native to our area. It's a native to uh, Southeast Asia. And depending on the literature you read and what you look at, it uh, infests anywhere from a half of a billion to over a billion acres uh, worldwide. So needless to say, there's lots of it out there. It's found on every continent in the United States except on Antarctica. And it has a general tropical or subtropical range, but you'll notice when we look at some of the other maps here that uh, it is moving even somewhat out of theirs. When you think about the worst weeds in the, in the world, a lot of people think in our area of the country anyway about kudzu. And one of the comments that I like to make about kudzu is that kudzu is a pussycat when it comes to thinking about kogan grass. So if you thought kogan grass was bad, then, or you know, kudzu was bad, then just wait until you learn more about this, this critter. We have it um, started all over. I was going to try and use the illustrator, but I guess it's not, it's not there. Anyway, uh, just north of Australia, in that region right there on the map, is where this Kogan grass is native in the uh, eastern part of Asia and in that area right there. And it has had the opportunity to spread. And what you see in white as far as the color there is pretty well the range of it that we have, um, you know, across the, the country. And if you look at the uh, different um, uh, areas here on this map, you will find that um, those dots indicate where there are heavy concentrations of this material. This is the uh, the native area where we had this starting out, and you see then we've had concentrations uh, down here in Australia, here around the Mediterranean area, and now we see a concentration of it over here in the United States. We're one of the more recent, if you will, groups of people that have come into the Cud or the Kogan grass world. The first appearance here in the United States was in the Grand Bay, Alabama area, and it was an escapee, if you will, from um, packing material that was used in packing materials uh, or packing things that were shipped into that area. That happened in 1912. Now. As with everything, someone noticed this nice green growing stuff out there near that bay and wondered about it and said, well, that looks pretty good. And uh, some people in Mississippi thought, you know, that's probably good forage material. So the next thing you know, it's being tested or brought in for a forage material. Florida finds out about it. They get involved in the deal. They're bringing it in too. But it didn't take them very long to learn that in reality, um, this is not good forage material. You're dealing with a, a plant material that uh, is high in silica content. It has a double serrated bladed uh, leaf on it, and it's just not very palatable, and animals really don't like it. Sometimes they'll eat it, but it's got to be just about the last thing that's out there. Here's the range then we have as far as uh, the United States is concerned and all these green areas. We have two hotbeds, if you will of uh, four Kogan grass, and those are in those particular areas there, where in the Florida area we have over a million acres, and we have several hundred thousand acres that are located up here in the Alabama-Mississippi region. The expected range as far as what people think it could do in the United States is shown by this red line here, and you'll notice that it's got lots of room to grow. However, in 
since 1912, you say, what are you worried about? It didn't get very far, but it's one of these things that with invasives, as you build a population and, and you get a base behind it, it can move fairly rapidly. And we'll talk about the rate of movement here in just a little bit. And then here you see the two lines put together and you see where we are. It shows that on this map that the very northern part of South Carolina probably wouldn't get this. We really don't know whether that's true or not. And then as climate change is an issue that we're facing, who knows where it's going to be. This blue line that you see here right now, though, is the area that we're really concerned with, and it's the area that we're interested in working, because there's where we have uh, smaller populations of it, and we have the opportunity to see if we can't you know, bring this under control. If you look at this map right here, you'll see that uh, the lighter uh, area on the top is called outliers and basically that's just where there's scattered populations and that's the area we want to concentrate on and seeing what we can do. Here in South Carolina we have seven counties that are infested and Steve Compton is going to talk more about that later so I'll just show you this map here to give you an idea of what our problem is here. A pretty plant, people see it growing along the roadside or someplace else, sometimes they want to dig some of it up, take it with them, do something or other. But what they don't realize is that it can look like this in just a, you know, a period of time, where it's taken over everything and it occupies the total site. And that, of course, is a real problem. Let's talk a little bit about the biology of this particular plant. It grows in loose, compact bunches, and it contains several leaves. Uh, generally speaking, you, when you think about it, it doesn't have a stem. It just all the leaves rise up you know, from the ground. They originate from that ground level. Um, you see different reports in the literature, you know, you know, one foot tall, four feet tall, and you wonder why. Well, when you find out that it grows on any kind of site that you have out there, you begin to realize that uh, you can have a lot of variety. And you see here also that the talk, comment about the prominent um, off-center white midrib, and that's something that will be talked about more as we go through here. The margins, I've already mentioned, are finely serrated, and the plant does accumulate silicates. Now, the seed production is predominantly in the spring, and that's when we find the flowers. It's not unlike a lot of grasses, which bloom primarily just in uh, later in the season. This one blooms fairly early. You have uh, long, fluffy, white seed heads on them. They're you know two to eight inches long, depending on how well the plant is doing. And unfortunately, mowing, burning, or fertilization uh, you know, just induces additional uh, seed production. As far as the seeds are concerned, here's the seed head, by the way, and you can see uh, these are, it's kind of matted together here, but there's hundreds and even could be thousands of seeds there on a given plant. The seed is relatively short-lived, living in just, you know, less than a year. The rhizomes, though, are a different story, and the rhizomes are another component then of the plant as far as production is concerned. And if you'll notice here this comment uh, about 60%, uh, that's a huge amount of material to be just in the root mass. But that's what we have with this particular grass. We have almost all of its mass being actually below the ground. And you can see there the comment that, you know, you can have as much as 40 tons per acre of this material. Now, while it says it penetrates soil to depths of four feet, you're going to find almost all of your roots, just like you do in virtually all plants, within the top foot. In fact, is the top six to ten inches. But that mass of roots that you're going to find there is huge. And if you look in the diagram there, you see roots everywhere. These white things that there are through here are the roots, and they're just a mass of them going every which direction. If anyone's ever dug up a clump of bamboo or something of this nature, the rhizomes and the density of it are really quite similar. When we look at the uh, rhizomes again, uh, you have the central core, so they do resist breakage, and you get larger pieces of them, if you will, breaking up. You can actually have each piece which can regenerate and form many different new plants, because basically when you look at them, you can have several segments here, and each one of these segments then and you can see them on the end where these scales are. That's a plant, that's a plant, that's a plant, or they have the potential of all becoming plants. So, you know, just one small rhizome can really re reproduce a lot of additional material. 
the apical dominant